Little babies left on your doorstep that of course never cry. Cribs filled with sleeping angelic children and backyards filled with laughter and kids simply playing. Before we started foster parenting 14 years ago, I really had an unrealistic expectation about what foster care was really like. And so today I wanna to share with you seven things I wish I would have known before we took our first foster care placement. foster care. Let's be honest. Before you take that first placement, it can feel scary. It can feel like someone's about to take you and drop you in the middle of this big maze and you have no idea which way to go or what to do. And you really maybe don't even have anyone to give you answers in your community. At least that is how I felt when we became foster parents 14 years ago. And so today I just want to share with you seven things that I wish I would have known before we took our first foster placement. And be sure to watch till the end for my final thoughts. So the first thing that I wish I would have known before taking my first foster placement was that foster care, it really is a roller coaster ride. It's the kind of ride where you're going forward and all of a sudden you stop and it may feel like you're going upside down and backwards or a quick shift to the right or to the left. And I know I've talked about this before in my foster care videos, but it is so true. If you think that foster care is a straight line, maybe to a destination, maybe to get a child or to focus on reunification for the birth parents, likely that journey is going to have a lot of twists and turns and you will be surprised. The other thing about foster care is that likely the destination that you think a case or a child is headed, it may look completely different. What we've experienced is that cases often turn out completely different than we ever think that they were, they're were they going to and there is no way to know where the roller coaster is going or where or when you may get off that particular ride. So the second thing that I wish I would have known before my first placement was this. Do not buy everything. Ah, oh, this one is so hard for me. I so often, as soon as I get a placement, I want to run out and buy everything that I can. The truth is, you may even be matched with a child who's going to come to your home. And for us, what we've experienced is at the last minute, they find a relative or they find a, um, another placement that may be better suited towards that child. And so until that child actually comes into your home, a lot of times it's a good idea to not shop for that child. I'm guilty of doing that. I've done it over and over again. And in a moment, I'll share a story with you. Um, but what happens is you may get a child that's three months old, for example, but that child may be big and beefy and it may be in six to nine months clothes or you may get a five-year-old and that five-year-old is really petite and only wears 2T. And so really there's no way of predicting when you get placed or matched with a social worker, you can always ask the size. And when you know or have you know really high likelihood that that child is coming into your home, you can go out and shop then. But sometimes you just don't know. We've had situations where we have even been told that a boy was coming to our house and it ended up being a girl at the very last moment. And so we are terrible at following this rule, but I do wish that I would have known it before we took our very first foster placement. One example is a little girl um, that we had in our care. And when she came, we had her for about two weeks, but we assumed because we were, were a long placement family that's long term, we just assumed that she was staying. So what did I do? I went out and spent about $150 of clothes for her. She came with nothing. So that includes t-shirts and bibs and coats and shoes and all the things. And what happened was within a couple of weeks at the last minute, I believe it was even the same day, that little girl, she went home. And I was devastated, but I, what I did was send all those brand new clothes home with that little girl. A couple of weeks later, that little girl came back into care. And what happened? I assumed that she would come with at least part of the clothes that I had sent with her, but the truth was she didn't. She came with secondhand used clothes and all of the clothes that I had sent were gone. It turns out that little girl again went back 
I sent another round of even more clothes because of course she stayed longer and I bought more. And then she came back into care again. And again, that little girl came with nothing. And so really I spent probably $500 literally on this child and um, all those clothes were gone. And so this can happen. Um, I understand, I know that biological family, when they get kids uh, back from foster care, a lot of times those clothes can be a reminder of their time that their child was taken away, reminder of maybe another family that that child loved. And so those biological families maybe can just get rid of them or just not use them. And um, we may never see those clothes again. And that child maybe doesn't even get a chance to access those clothes. And so please, please, please just beware. Try not to go out and buy anything and everything. And again, I'm a terrible example because I tend like I always do that. Um, but that is one thing that I wish I would have known early on is not just go buy everything, buy what that child needs, particularly for that age, for the size of the child, and for that specific child's requirements or what it needs to be able to be in your home in care. The third thing that I wish I would have known before taking my first foster placement is to keep impeccable records of the kids that are in your care. And I was told this in my initial training and I tried to do this. So what we specifically do is that we have this cupboard that we open and within that cupboard there are different files. So every child when they come into our care, uh, they get a file. And so that initial file, usually it's something, I know the social worker sometimes has like a little pamphlet or maybe a paper or two, but I keep my own file for that child. I write their name in big bold pen on the front and I put everything that's for that child within that packet uh, just so that I have it. And so when I get a phone call maybe from a doctor or a social worker asking about that child or the medical needs or the school, I know that instantly I can go and I keep them color coordinated as well. So one child will have a blue packet, one will have a green or a yellow one. And so I know in my mind, for me, that's just better to remember to go straight to maybe the blue packet, pull it out and look for whatever is needed to be able to tell the person on the phone what it is that their needs are or their medical needs or maybe the last medical exam or the date of something that they had had done. And so that's just a really great way to keep track of the kids that are in your care and the medical information that they have because it's so important to keep records. Another thing is to make sure to keep those files for your children because a lot of times a child will leave and I've been guilty of this. I've just taken the whole file and thought I just don't need it and I throw it in the garbage. So I did that early on and then later maybe I would have that child back into care or um, another foster parent or a social worker or someone from the state would call uh, sometimes weeks or months later and I would need that information. And so I learned really well early on in foster care to keep those files of those children as long as you can or as long at least as you stay licensed and maybe even keep really important papers. So if there's papers that maybe years down the road that that child may need or a social worker or maybe even an adopted parent may call you or refer to you and try to get that information for their benefit or the benefit of the child, that's a recommendation I would say is to keep those files for as long as you possibly can. Also, I would highly suggest to keep records of the child's behavior. So this is something that I do online. I do through email. I don't do a lot of texting or calling my social workers. I know that they're really, really busy. Uh, I know that doctors are busy and it's so hard. I know for me, when I hear something audibly, it's hard for me to really keep track of it unless it's written down. And so what I personally do is if there's maybe an accident or a child gets hurt or you know there's some behaviors and I would highly recommend a meeting Immediately when a child comes into care to document their behavior because what you will see is a transformation of those child's behaviors over the next couple weeks and the next couple months and so what you want to do is to be able to later show that judge the differences what did that child look like when it came into care what behaviors did it have what was it saying what was it doing and then later compare that maybe for with the progress or maybe the lack of progress so that there is a spectrum for that uh, judge or the social worker or for the guardian and light him to be able to look at and observe and to be able to see concrete evidence of how that child progressed or didn't progress while it was in your care. 
Another great reason for emails is because I personally, as a foster parent, can go back to an email from years before and look and say, okay, what was this child doing or saying? What did I document? When a child initially comes into care, sometimes I will email the social worker daily. Uh, sometimes it will be every week, depending on the child and where it came from. Did it come from a different foster home? Did it come immediately into care, into placement after being with its biological family? And so that's something that I do. I see, see uh, the supervisor a lot of the times, the guardian ally item, depending on the case, I keep a reference for myself so that I can look back on it and make sure that there is written evidence of behaviors and everything about that child because you'll want that later on in that child's case. And the fourth thing that I wish I would have known before I took my first foster placement was to not take on more than I could chew. And so this is a really, really hard thing as a foster parent. As foster parents, I get emails all the time about kids and their behaviors and their situations, about how they have no placement or they have nowhere to go on the weekend. And I know in my mind that these children are going to stay at a hotel or they're going to sleep at the social worker's offices or have to go home with the social worker and they have nowhere to go. And as a foster mom, and my guess is if you're a foster parent, this is something that can grip your heart so much that it can be so easy to go beyond what we think that we even can do or what we the limitations that maybe our home or our family has. And so I would really encourage you just to really listen to your heart, to not take on more than you can chew, and to make sure that you get a lot of support from family and from friends. So the fifth thing that I wish I would have known before taking my first foster placement, it would be as a Christian for me personally, is to seek God and to seek out the will of and the desires and the heart and the condition of my family before taking another foster placement. So I will tell you a story really quick that we had a little tiny baby we had for a while and she got taken kind of suddenly. It's a long story, but in that we were really grieving as a family. We were really sad. The circumstances, the way that she left, it was really quite heartbreaking. And so we were kind of in the pits of despair. We loved this baby. And I mean, we could just imagine our lives forever with this little tiny infant that we had cared for since bringing her home from the hospital. So what happened was it wasn't that long later, maybe a couple days or a week later, we were out shopping. We were at the mall. We get this call and there is another little baby at the hospital. Our hearts were so sad and the thought of going to the hospital and picking up a brand new teeny tiny infant, it reminded us of this little girl that we had taken home. And so kind of without even praying about it or discussing it, we just said, should we take her? And of course, we just jumped and took this little girl. It turns out that this little girl was so hard. She was drug exposed and she cried and cried nonstop and she was so hard to take care of. It ended up that she left, but it was a great lesson to me and to my family to not take something on rebound. That's never a good idea to not take a child because you feel sorry for it or because you think it's just a great idea. Really seek what is best for your family, for your marriage, for the children already that are in your home. And more importantly, if you're a Christian, what does God think? Does he want you to take that particular child? Because if he does, there will be grace for that child. But if he doesn't, it may be almost impossible to care for that child apart from the grace of God assisting you along the way. So the sixth thing that I wish I would have known before taking my first placement is that setting boundaries is okay. And uh, again, this is so hard. Setting boundaries around family time and couple time and time individually with each of my children. Setting boundaries with social workers saying this is what I can and I cannot do. This is what I will and will not do. What will you do? Do you want to drive to visits? Do you not want to drive to visits? Do you want a child that has significant needs or do you not think that you're capable of taking care of a child with significant needs? Do you feel like that you want to have a relationship with the vile parents? Or is your family situation and that child so difficult that it would be impossible to form a really close relationship with that biological family? What is it that you most need? Be aware of it, maybe write it down, discuss it with your spouse and your kids, and really stick to it. Set boundaries and make sure that those that is the margin or the roadmap for you going forward as a foster parent. And lastly, number seven of the things that I wish I would have known before taking my first foster placement, it would be to keep everything 
neutral. And so this is kind of a broad and big, but it's so important. This is what I've learned. So before you get a placement again, I just mentioned that sometimes it's a girl or a boy. And if you are all about all pink clothes and, you know, all girly things and you end up with a boy, you're going to spend a lot of time and a lot of resource, a lot of energy. You're going to need a lot of storage for the things that are not a girl. And so keeping maybe clothes like white onesies or, you know, maybe grays or neutral colored clothes if you do want to shop ahead of time and as well as the room so the rooms for us in our home what we've come to realize is a light gray or a light taupey color a color that's neutral and this can be for a couple of reasons so it can be good because you don't know if it's a boy or a girl that you're going to take but what we've also found is that sometimes that kids that come into care they have sensory issues or ADHD and what we have found is that we have had bright pink rooms, bright green rooms. And what we found is really bright colors, although they're super cute and they make really great Instagram photos, they are not always the best suit for a foster child. They can be overstimulating. A lot of kids that are in care already struggle with sleep. And so if you have rooms that are bright and there's a lot going on in those rooms, it can be really difficult for that child to regulate and to calm itself down and to be able to sleep at night as well. And so I would suggest to keep the room Keep the clothes that you buy all neutral. In addition, I would suggest that you keep the communication and the things that you share with those that are in the parties in the case neutral. So that includes the information that you share with the social workers. You do not want to appear biased towards the birth parents, against the birth parents, or with an agenda based on your own feelings or opinions or ideas. You want to be very factual when you write up things to the social worker or when you share information. You don't want to appear like you have a favored interest or a favored case plan. You want your communication to be straightforward, very logical, very neutral, as well as your relationship. So those may be with the birth parents, with the transporters, with the guardian ad litem, with the judges. Your job as a foster parent is to care and to seek out the best interests of that foster child. And so we don't want to run off and state our opinions. I mean, that can be just so confusing as a social worker is work, working with the birth parents or working, you know, with agencies and they're trying to figure out what to do or how to do it. And so if we're in there with really strong opinions or insisting on a certain way, it can be really difficult for everybody. However, there are times that we do need to step in if a child is in danger, if a child is about to be hurt or it has been hurt, it is so important that we become loud and very vocal, not just to the social workers, but to the judges, to the guardian and litems and everybody involved. The rest of the time, it is important as much as possible to keep not only the room and the clothes, but our conversations and the things that we share with those within the case as neutral as you possibly can. These are my final thoughts. A lot of times when we become a foster parent, there can be so much fear. We can be afraid, afraid to lose maybe our regular routine, maybe time with our spouse or time at the gym every single day. And so we can think that love only divides and the relationships with these kids and becoming a foster parent will just divide or subtract from our lives. But the truth is these kids, they will add to your life. Love, it multiplies. The more we give it, the more we receive it, the more we have to give. And so I just want you to look at foster care like a huge blessing that you will, yes, there will be some things that you will have to change and switch up and there will be equations to where life will not look like it ever did before. But I guarantee it that foster kids, they will add to your life and the love that you've experienced before, it will be multiplied. Thank you so much for watching and remember to subscribe below for more videos like this on foster care, faith, and family. And remember, go out, live bold, and be brave.